So welcome back. Today we are concluding our series on C.S. Lewis's Space Trilogy. This is truly an opportunity for anyone in apologetics to open up those doors when it comes to science fiction. Just like in all the other reviews that we've done, we're also going to go ahead and give away a copy of this book. We'll give you the details into how to win it um, as we go on. But before we continue, congratulations to Michelle for winning Paralandra. The ebook copy was sent to her. If you don't see it, check your um, spam and see if it is in there. Uh, that Hideous Strength, book number three in the Space Trilogy, is a dystopian science fiction fantasy novel written by C.S. Lewis, and uh, it was first published in 1945, a year after his second book, Paralandra, so he was pretty quick on getting that out. He subtitled it A Modern Fairy Tale for Grown-Ups, since it has elements of both magic and science. And that sort of reflects a famous quote from C.S. Lewis that someday you will be old enough to read fairy tales. Um, Out of the Silent Planet, the first book in the series takes place on Mars, Paralandra. The second book takes place on Venus. And that hideous strength comes back to Earth. And it, the entire novel takes place on Earth. If I were to sum up the novel in one sentence, it would be that hideous strength shows the struggle between an evil that wants to eradicate life and a good that desires to grow life to its fullest potential, which is really to say that's almost about any plot that's out there. <laughs> so very generic. <laughs> we don't want to give any spoils away, but there's a lot in this book to unpack. Um, we will be doing a live stream next week about this spiritual journey, diving into this book much deeper, just like we did with Paralandra. There's just so much to uncover that we can't do it in this book review. Now, to let you guys know about a little bit about this book, um, it's not following Ransom. Ransom is a character in this book. He's not the primary. We're actually dealing with a dual protagonist in this one. And that's a bit of a change for some some readers. So be aware of that going in. There are a lot of smaller characters that are in here. In fact, it's very easy to get lost in the number of characters in this book. Yeah, very easy. yeah. The, the, the plot's a little thick, some dry sometimes, um, and there are a lot of characters. It's easy to get lost. You almost have to have a cheat sheet to the characters on the side to figure out, okay, who are we talking about here? Um, but there's a lot of good nuggets in, in there, too. So it's it's worth taking a look at, I think. Now, the book length that we're looking at is about 384 pages long. This is much longer than any of the other books. In fact, they've been getting bigger as they go. And this one is, I'd say, about 30% larger than Paralandra was. So, as far as sexual content, what would you say the intensity of the sexual content in this book uh there was one scene that was sort of like an intended it wasn't i wouldn't it was not a rape scene but it was a um sexual harassment i would guess and that was probably about it there's there's parts no spoilers towards the end maybe where there's a lot of hey romantic kind of stuff going on but that's about it now, this does have an actual LGBTQ character in it. Yes, he's very so, progressive. Very for progressive. The 1940s, yes. I would say that there's low. There's definitely that one scene that's pretty intense. Um, and then after that, it would be just kept between a romantic level of it. Yeah. Nothing more implied. Uh, violent content to expect in this book. It's up there. It's up there. I this would is, say this is more of an uh, R rating. If it were to hit the theaters uh, based on, on violence, especially more to the end, can I say that? Definitely. Like it gets, in, it yeah. gets intense. Yeah. Um, very high. 
I would definitely say very high. Um, blood and gore, again, I would say very high yeah. in this. It's up there. It doesn't um, go into a whole lot of description, but yeah, it's there. There's a lot right. of stuff happening. Yep. This is not a book for kids. And the other thing I should probably mention, too, it makes it different from the other two novels, is the genre is almost different. Uh, the first one is, the first book is, ex, you know, Exploration of Mars. You know, it's, it's, it's coming up and he's, he's like an explorer. The second one is a great debate, philosophical debate between uh, two characters, Imperial Andra, basically the snake and the anti-snake in the Garden of Eden. Um, this one is a dystopian uh, novel and there's there's some some darkness in here that's like yeah this isn't necessarily for kids this is this is older you know teens um, anything R rated that would be appropriate if you think R rated for movies would be basically that for for this book so crude or profane language what are you saying that it's there it's there I'd say medium I mean they're not dropping f bombs but you know it's still the it's, it's still underlining. It's there. Yeah. Now, one thing about that, too, is that um, the, the Brits seem to have a different level of, you know, like we have, George Carlin said, the seven words you can't say on TV. You know, we had that level of uh, profanity. They had a different level for things that they could say and stuff like that. So you can sort of think of it on the, the British side for this. Definitely. Um, drug and alcohol use, I'd say that there's quite a, quite a lot. Yep. Um, definitely. Not right. not drug. It's not like they're doing dropping LSD or stuff like that. But as far as the drinking goes, it's it's a part yeah. of the culture, especially the collegiate culture that's in here because it's had a lot to do with the college, this university that's in there, and the staff, and you know their drinking buddies and stuff. But that that's in there. Um, as far as the drugs go, well, there's also drunkenness involved in this. There's alcoholism that starts playing a part in it. Um. As far as the drugs go, it's mostly tobacco, smoking. Um, I think that's primary, other than when you're looking at medical drugs being used yeah. in some capacity. So now that you guys know what content to expect, um, I do want to make a quick mention that this is a really good depiction of when God steps in to a situation. A really good depiction of a battle between the devil and God, good and evil, when he puts his authority down. Um, but to the giveaway, the question about the giveaway. So what you need to do is you need to like this video, share it, subscribe to the channel, and go check out the newsletter in the description. Go ahead and sign up for that so we can go ahead and send you off the new copy and we'll have that sent to you by the time we do our next review and you can throw your name into it. This will also enter you into winning any future book that we review. So it's a one-time entry, multiple possibilities of winning. So without further ado though, we are hitting the spoilers, so duck and cover. <laughs> Okay, so here we are. The real fun part. Well, okay, so a lot of this book now has to do with two main, the two, there's the dual protagonists here. There's two main characters. And so when you start reading this, you're thinking, okay, where's it? Where's uh, Ransom? He's, he, de he doesn't show up until much later in the book. This is something we warned about earlier. Uh, so the two characters are uh, Mark Studdick and Jane Studdick. And their marriage is kind of on the rocks. They've, uh, they're they're really not believers, which is really interesting because he's taking this from a point of view from two people who aren't Christians, and uh, Jane is trying to be the good wife and supporting her husband, more or less. She really wants to get back in and do. She was working on a thesis or get get a, a send her. She had a um, undergraduate degree. She wanted to extend that. She wanted to do some more work on that. Uh, Mark though wants to really fit into this college is a professor and he wants to be in the in crowd and that is what his his moral flaw is he's willing to sacrifice take do whatever it takes to be accepted and on the in crowd and that's where his downfall is um 
I think there's a, an important note, one of the things that you touched on there that definitely does come into play later is what Jane's been doing. She has put off any sort of kids, family, mm -hmm. in sacrifice of pursuing her goals as a progressive woman. Yeah. Yeah. And so this is interesting to see from back in the 40s, which would have been, I guess, maybe some of the cutting edge ideas back then. But and we're looking at progressivism now and seeing the, the fruits of it at our in our era. But back then, she was really struggling with that. What should I do? I don't want to be subjected to my husband. I don't want to have to tell him what I'm doing. I want to be able to live my life fully. And like you said, part of that is they're, they're childless. And there's a point in the story where um, Merlin says, you guys blew it. You guys could have had a kid and that kid would have been very, very, uh, had great potential and could have been a, a game changer in the world. But because you chose not to have children, um, we're all worse for yeah. wear. The missed opportunity with having a child that could have impacted the the world, it seemed like it was a pretty big deal that this this uh, child would have been a game changer. Um, but that's the, that's the course they chose. And there's something, there's a lesson to be learned in here about missed opportunity. God gives us the opportunity to do things, and there is forgiveness and redemption, but through our sin, if we lose an opportunity, that opportunity can be gone. Now, God has plan B, plan C, plan D, and that could be really fulfilling. But the original things that were intended were not. An example of that would be the whole Garden of Eden experience. <laughs> Look at Paralandra. We had an opportunity to go from the garden to glory. Boom! Right there, the entire human race. But we didn't. Um, our ancestors said, nope, we want, to, we want to call our own shots. And when that happened, uh, sin entered the world, and then plan B came in, and that was Christ on the cross. Of course, it, of course he knew uh, beforehand that was going to happen, and uh, the, the lamb was slain before the foundation of the world. So we, we, he already knew that. But plan A would have been much better. And so it is in our own lives, personally, with Mark and, and uh, Jane Studdick, they could have had something really good had they gone that, but they didn't. But So plan B came in, and her plan was, or her situation is, she's clairvoyant. She can see. She basically has visions. She can see things happening, and both sides really want to be able to use her for that, right? Yep. And I'm going to jump around a little bit in this because the story is, is There's so There's so many plots going on, so there many really levels is. to this. To really understand and to get the full impact, you have to read it yourself. Yeah. Um, and I think this might be a good point to say that I'm, I'm not in, in, entirely impressed with, with the writing of the book. Um, I would say that as an author, I would say this would be an earlier draft or middle draft of, of the book. Um, sorry, now I'm a huge C.S. Lewis fan, but this one is just not. It's like, dude, no. But I'm also looking at it from the perspective of today's uh, writing. And you would, you would write differently for today's audience than you would have back in the 1940s. I would have taken out a lot of the slow spots in there, a lot of the dialogue that's going down. I would have clipped that and focused in on more of the action and the real nuggets of philosophy. And we're going to be talking about that later, some, mm -hmm. of, the, some of the good quotes that are in there. Yes, we'll be talking about that next week as we dive in. Right. So um, there's, there are some things I would have changed with that, but... The there's a good con so so I wouldn't give the book a really great rating, but if you can pull out some of the nuggets there and some of the uh, some of the thoughts and philosophy, that's it's there's some really good stuff. There's a great contrast between what's happening to Mark and what's happening to his wife, in that Mark is going with the N I C E. Great name, right? In yeah, that. nice, nice, always so nice. <laughs> The so, NICE, like, yeah, with their own police force. Right. They're nice police. They're nice. So, so you have just like most political uh, acts or or um, uh, organizations that go out. They give you a name that does actually the opposite of what what it's talking about. So the NICE, which stands for the um, 
National Institute for Coordinated Experiments. The idea is that science will solve all our problems. Well, I'm a, I'm a big believer in science. I freak, my last name is Newton, all right? So we invented gravity. Thank you very much. All royalties come come to us. You know, I appreciate it. But All lawsuits? Don't go there. If you fall hey. down, it's not my fault. So um, You invented it. Yeah, that's right. Well, okay. So there's a recall on gravity. Just letting you know. But... With science, and I'm, I'm an engineer, so I, 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 big in that, but it is not an end-all. It doesn't answer everything. And if you treat it at that, at like that, you lose humanity. There's a, there's, a, there's a part that comes out because it's not an answer to everything. Just like even physics itself, you have quantum physics and classical physics. They don't answer everything by themselves. Maybe eventually there, there will be a unified theory that brings everything together, but you can't, you can't know anything either. The, the Heisenberg uncertainty principle says there are some things you just can't know. So science doesn't solve anything, but this NICE, the National Institutes for Coordinated Experiments, did. They tried to. Hey, we have an answer for everything. And eventually the answer was, we need to kill everything. Yeah. Everything needs to die. One of the, one of the characters in the book was talking about, look at the moon. The moon is beautiful. It's been cleansed. There is no life on it. Nothing too. That's not. Don't That's do not that beauty. to the earth. Don't please don't do that to the earth. So there's a contrast between the both what's happening to Jane and what's happening to Mark. And uh, for example, he comes across uh, a, a a a character in the NICE who is this hardcastle called the Fairy, nicknamed the Fairy. Um, she's a single woman. She's uh, um, very intense. She, she's a professional woman. And you have a professional woman in, on the other side, too, with um, under the Pendragon, which is the other group, Miss Grace Ironwood. If you look at the two names, Hard Castle, Ironwood, there's a lot of names that New Lewis does. So there's, there's uh, nuance that's, that's in here. You have Ransom. You remember that. Yeah, this is the same book series. I named his first character Ransom. Right. As a Ransom in two of the stories. Yeah, there's a long-winded bureaucrat named John Wither that's also in the NICE, and he's like, uh, the, he's very high in the organization. And he'll go on, you talk to him, and he says, well, let me be very straightforward with you. And then he goes on to these complicated explanations that basically say nothing. And he, he you find out later that he is basically... Uh, deadened in his thoughts, he has been sucked into this nether world, and is, there's he's basically a husk. So a name like Wither, well, that should tell you something about the character. And so, so it goes on and on like that. So, well, Hutton Castle, just talking about her for a second, is the lesbian dominatrix. Yeah, <laughs> would be the best <laughs> description of her. If you got that picture in your head, yep, yeah, that's that's Hard Castle right there. Yeah. So there's a, there's a whole other aspect in this, too, that comes into it, and that is where the, uh, the fantasy or the Arthurian legends bleed into, into this. And you have uh, Merlis Ambrosius, Merlin, who has been unearthed and, and, and becomes a part of it. Very interesting how the theology comes in. I'm not quite sure how, how the theology in this is all structured with, with some of the... Uh, um, Arthurian legend that leads into it, but uh, that was if, if Ransom does talk about that in some regards when he's talking about Merlin, saying, "Hey, that was basically border when you guys were doing it that way back then. That was basically borderline. You really shouldn't be doing it. You can kind of wiggle the line a little bit, um, but when it came to this time period, you really can't." Those, that time period's past is now very clear line. Right. I think that's where he was going with that, saying, hey, you can't, you can't do both now. Okay, so a bit of trivia. And if, for those who've read the book, I'm just going to throw this out there. And, and, and I have not asked your brother in Christ this question, so he's just going to be broadsiding him. Oh, that, boy. That hideous strength was written... Uh, as a retelling of a particular biblical story. Hmm. Which one was it? 
The hint was, this is a, not the whole thing, but particularly at the end, the climax. What happens to the NICE? What happens to their destruction? I'm not talking about the head. And by the way, that's another parallel. You talk about the head of the NICE and the head of uh, St. Anne's being the Pentragon. Uh, the head of the NICE is a literal head. <clears throat> so what is the retelling of the story? Do you know this which be, story it's retelling? Could it be the Tower of Babel? Hey, hey there you go. You're winner. So you get a free copy. Here you go. Here's your copy. So it's uh, my copy. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Technicality. Uh, so uh, yeah, this is this is um, uh, that's that's another aspect of it, and some other uh, some other I don't know if you want to call it. There's not really spoilers. Maybe Easter eggs. Uh, the novel makes reference several times to Numenor and the True West. Uh, where have you heard those terms before? Hmm. By another author by the name of J.R.R. Tolkien. Right. And uh, we did mention this in an earlier video, but the main, not the main character here, but a supporting character, the main character in the other books, Ellen Ransom, is uh, based on Lewis's friend. J.R.R. Tolkien. Yes. And they had made uh, an agreement earlier. He and Lewis had made an agreement earlier, said, you write, Lewis, you write a book on uh, science fiction, and Tolkien would write one on uh, uh, time travel, which he eventually, did, how many, did he publish it or did his son publish his it? His son published it. His son published it. So he did write one, so it's obscure, it's not very well known, but he actually, J.R. Tolkien did actually write a time travel book. So this whole thing then is based somewhat on Tolkien as being the Pentragon. And that's where the Arthurian legend comes in because of his background with uh, some of the uh, medieval literature. Now some of the, I guess my most enjoyable parts would be the final climax when everything comes together. Um, the twist with Marlin was really good. I did see that one coming. I was really, was good. I was, was cool. I was hoping it was going to go that way. I was hoping that was going to be the twist. But when Merlin ends up being on the good guy's side all along, and they didn't even have to do anything to convince him to join the good side, it was fantastic. Um, and then the, the just plan. the description of the final battle. Yeah, and the plants, uh, the different aspects of the planets then coming in into play there, and the or, or Yarsu of each of those planets then descending on St. Anne's and what happens with that. Uh, what did you think about the bear? The bear was great. The bear has <laughs> got to be one of my favorite characters. I love the bear. Yeah, yeah. So a little bit of uh, comic relief in there. Much needed comic relief. Yes. So I would say overall, um, you do have to trudge through a lot of the dialogue that's in there. Um, again, if I was rewriting it, I would trim that down and focus it more. But uh, once you get through that, and there's there's other parts of the book that can be uh, interesting, pay attention to what's going on, because there's, like I said, with the, moves fast. the whole parallel that's in there, there's a lot of uh, subtlety that was written in, into the entire book. Yeah, and then the rest of the final battle being basically Merlin walks in and just wipes the floor with everyone with God's power and that's about it. I think that is by far the best depiction of God versus the devil that we have. A lot of times we have, you know, the idea of, you know, God on one side and the devil on the other side and they're playing chess and one's taking one piece, one taking the other piece. No, it's not an equal fight. When God gets serious and steps in like that, yeah, it's, it's, it's just, it just wipes the floor and it just yeah. walks on through. And there, the whole battle is one-sided. The NICE can't do anything. In fact, they're so lost with themselves, they end up doing more harm to each other than they yeah. do to the, well, the good side. Yeah, so, so the enemy eats its own. And that's part of... This, you see it in, in uh, the screw tape letters, you see it in this, you see it in some other C.S. Lewis works, where um, the the ultimate goal is, well, you're just basically 
not just being used by those in charge of you. You're, 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 you're to be consumed by those in charge of you. There's a really creepy ending with the head. Absolutely. And you, just, you just see it coming with the two guys that are left that just look at each other and say, I want, the head says, I want more, more blood. Uh, and so they end up, you know, doing themselves in. It's, it's also a contrast between nature versus uh, technology. And you saw that a lot in, in J.R.R. Tolkien's writings, too, where uh, Saruman had basically this mechanized process that's going through this, this uh, industrialization versus the Shire, which is more agricultural. And that's where Tolkien's preference was. And so if Lewis is writing this more with Tolkien in mind, he has the NICE, everything's mechanized, we're going to wipe everything clean, get rid of all nature, and then you have the more natural part that that defeats, ends up defeating the enemy because nature takes its place. It, it overcomes. The animals destroy. So in conclusion, as we are wrapping up our final thoughts on this, I know that you were saying that this book isn't the way you have written it, I definitely wouldn't have changed main character names. That's something that drove me nuts, definitely with adding so many other characters all at the same time. I was a loss. I know Divine ends up playing a part in this. Divine was from the first book. Um, I He's was... Lord Featherstone in this one. And so it's it's hard to keep hold. I mean, the Pendragon, I mean, Ransom was called the Pendragon. He was called uh, Kingfisher, um, the Head. He was called a lot of different names. It's... it's with multiple characters, it was difficult to say, okay, what's going on with all these guys? Yeah, I got I got Ransom down. I kind of lost Divine in the entire thing. And it wasn't until afterwards I had to re-look and say, okay, so where was he actually? Who was he? Um, so I would have definitely streamlined the names a bit more. Probably removed a couple of the characters. Um, just because, again, that gets convoluted very quickly. Um... But that is our my conclusion. Anything you want to add? No. If you if you read it, enjoy it. Realize uh, there's some slow parts, but it's good. And let's go ahead and end the prayer. Lord of heaven and earth, we come before you. We thank you for the opportunity to go through the space trilogy together. For the wisdom and guidance you can give us through these books. I ask for your hand to be upon anyone who is watching this that you bless their day, that you come beside them and guide them as they are going through these studies and show them lessons through this. In the name of Jesus Christ, I pray. Amen. Amen.